Well, hello and welcome. Disability Law Show. That's what you've tuned into. John Scholes, Savannah, to Mark, and on the other side, there are lots to discuss today. We'll get to a bunch of emails from listeners and viewers. That is help at disabilityrights.ca. You want to reach out anytime to Savannah, member of his team. I'll give you the phone number. We'll throw that up on the screen throughout the show. one 855 821 5,900 and Savannah will get to today three mistakes your disability lawyer could make while handling your LTD claim. Not you, of course, but some other lawyer. So we'll get to that. Um, week that was, want to talk about this. We've talked about this on our radio shows. By the way, disabilityrights.ca if you want to find where you can catch our weekly radio show, which has been going on for years. Lots of good stuff uh, come out of that hour-long program as well. But uh, the TD insurance thing, what's going on with that? We've talked about that before. Yeah, so I mean, many people uh, will be aware of this because they would have heard in the past few weeks uh, a lot of media attention to the fact that there is a class action that was initiated by myself and, and uh, my firm, uh, several lawyers against TD uh, Bank and TD Insurance for travel insurance claims. Okay. And you know, John, I mean, we're, we're typically we're, we're insurance lawyers. I mean, the, the content of this show usually focuses on uh, uh, long-term disability, but this is an interesting, uh, an interesting topic. And, and again, it, it sort of ropes back into this whole idea of being vigilant with insurance companies and questioning them because their motive at the end of the day is not to help you, no matter how many times they tell you they're gonna be there when it rains. Uh, those TV commercials and radio commercials you hear, you know, their number one thing is profit. That's their objective. And so what happened was that uh, Kevin Lyons, who, who is our client, uh, had purchased a trip for himself, a 12-day trip to Italy, uh, or starting from Italy, a cruise from Italy. And, uh, of course, COVID hit uh, Canada earlier this year uh, in, in March. And he started having travel, advi uh, uh, travel advisories by the government, you know, don't go anywhere, uh, Air Canada start, you know, stopped uh, uh, right. flying to Italy, etc. And so what happened was is that Mr. Lyons did exactly the correct thing, which is that he ended up canceling his trip. And he had a TD Infinite uh, uh, credit card, and he put in a travel cancellation claim. Uh, and uh, he ought to have been reimbursed, re or refunded at least, uh, by the insurance company, his expenses that he lost for this trip. He was unable to go. And TD came back and said, no, because you were offered credits, uh, a credit for the cruise, for example, we're not going to reimburse you for it. And when he came to me and he told me that story, I looked at the uh, TD policy and, you know, I, the more I looked at it, the more I was scratching my head because nowhere in the policy did it say that if you get a credit for your expenses, that somehow disentitles you to reimbursement by the insurance company. And uh, I ended up running this by some colleagues of mine and we all agreed that TD was taking an incorrect position. And so we initiated this class action on behalf of all claimants under this specific policy. And, and again, John, you know, people can go to our website to get more information about this, but just Google TD insurance class action, uh, Sivan Tumark in my name, and you'll see the stories uh, by the CBC, by various news media across the country about this. And again, bringing it back to long-term disability, we deal with disability insurers all the time. And we're not afraid of high profile cases. Again, if you look at my name, my partner's name, James Fireman, Lior Samfiro with the Uber class action, we are not afraid to take on these big giants, these big entities. We have the expertise, we have the know-how, we have the money to back it up. And at the end of the day, what we tell people is this, you're not paying anything up front. We're gonna give you this information for free. If you want us to help you, fantastic. We're gonna be very selective about the cases that we bring forth because of our reputation, because of the amount of resources that we're gonna put into each one of these cases. So if you have a, a situation with your insurer, for example, a long-term disability insurer, where you've been denied long-term disability, or you've been cut off long-term disability, or you know someone who has, please put them in touch with us or tell them to go to our website, disabilityrights.ca, and get empowered, get the information that you need or give them the information that they need to make an informed decision on how to proceed with their insurance company. You can reach out by email, by the way, anytime as well, help at disabilityrights.ca, which is where we're going to go right now. Yvette is the first email for the day. Savannah Yvette writes in, says, uh, I originally stopped working because I needed surgery on my back. A few months later, my husband had multiple heart attacks and I de developed PTSD and a generalized anxiety condition along with osteoarthritis. The insurance company paid me for a while but cut me off a few months ago saying I could return to another occupation. I used to work as a customer service rep. Do I have options? 100% you have options, absolutely. And I always start these 
um, conversations, John, with potential uh, individuals, claimants who are contacting me by asking, what are your doctors saying? Right. Are they agreeing that you cannot work? And are they saying you can't work in your occupation or any occupation? And, and you know, depending on what the person tells me and what they tell me about themselves and their situation, I tell them if they have options. And you know, the reason why VET is experiencing this right now is because most LTD policies uh, contain provisions that stipulate, that say that to get LTD for the first two years, you have to demonstrate through you know, medical reports and, and whoever's treating you, giving the opinion that you cannot work in your own occupation. You cannot do the essential tasks of your own occupation. Beyond the two-year mark, the test changes. Now it's no longer can you do your own occupation, it's can you do any occupation for which you're suited for by training, education, or experience. That's key, right? Not just any occupation, it's any occupation for which you are suited for. And so in this case with a vet, I mean, she's experiencing you know, mental uh, uh, health issues. And, and, you know, for many people out there, and there are a lot of people, especially with COVID now, who are experiencing depression, anxiety, PTSD. John, these conditions are debilitating. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're a lawyer, a doctor, a pilot, a right. customer service uh, agent, you know, a grocery store clerk. It's irrelevant. If you have PTSD, if you can't get out of bed because of your depression, you can't do any occupation. That's the reality. So, you know, my advice here to a vet is, let's talk after the show. I will, I, I want to review some of the medical reports uh, that you have from your doctors. And if in fact they confirm that you cannot do any occupation at this particular point in time, the insurance company should not be stopping benefits. And we can go after them. We can force your insurer. If they are cutting you off prematurely, we can force them to either not cut you off or if they've done that already, to come to the table and, and in good faith settle your case, resolve your case. And, and remember something, John, this is important. When I talk about settlement, I'm not talking about taking 10 cents on the dollar. I'm going to tell someone if they should settle for a certain amount or not. And every case is specific and every person has their own circumstances they have to take you know, account of. But at the end of the day, my job is to navigate the legal landscape, the minefields, and to push back on the insurance company. Not just me, by the way, my entire team. This is a team approach. And at the end of the day, you as the individual make the final decision if you agree to the settlement or not. I don't have the power to force you or, or you know, I wouldn't do that anyways, but I don't have the power to force you to accept a settlement that you otherwise would not want to accept. So you're losing nothing by speaking with us so we can explain to you how to engage the insurance company from a legal standpoint to force them to pay you what you're owed. It's really interesting how you differentiate in Yvette's case. I mean, this is PTSD and anxiety as a result of things at home and otherwise she can't work. This is not the same as having PTSD and anxiety because of a bad boss. If not for that building, if she worked next door, she'd be able to work again. This is generalized no matter where she went. As your partner James Fireman says, this isn't bad boss insurance where you could go to another workplace and be fine. This is general, so it wouldn't matter where she worked. That's not the cause. You're completely correct. And in fact, this is a very important point to make because many insurance companies will say, you know, you're not experiencing a disability that is covered. You are experiencing, you know, workplace issues. And, right. you know, for that, you can go and hire an employment lawyer, which, by the way, we have employment lawyers. We do employment and disability law, so we can tell you uh, if it's an employment case or a disability case. But many insurance companies misconstrue the situation. Sometimes I think anecdotally, just by speaking with individuals and representing them, I think sometimes on purpose. In other words, you can have a situation where it's the toxic work environment that has given rise to the mental illness or the issue, the mental issues the person is experiencing, but now those mental issues are generalized. Now it no longer matters if that person works in that particular office or a different office altogether because now they are stressed, now they are depressed, they got PTSD, whatever it is. So at that point, it's no longer just an employment issue, although they may still have an employment case, it's also a disability issue and the insurance company can shirk away from their responsibility. They have to pay you what you're owed. We'll take a short break here. Coming up, three mistakes that your disability lawyer could be making while handling your claim. That is on the way. In the meantime, the number, 1-855-821-5900. And to reach out like Yvette through email, it is help at disabilityrights.ca. Stick around. We're coming right back. You lost your job. They only gave you two weeks of severance per year worked. But where can you find out what you're really owed? I'm going to severancepaycalculator.com. Find out how much you're owed right now. SeverancePayCalculator.com You've been denied long-term disability. You think you're powerless. 
but you have a lot more power than you think. I'll tell you a secret. It's a numbers game for the insurance company. They're betting on you walking away from money that they owe you. Don't make that mistake. We resolve disability claims all the time. We force insurers to pay what they owe. We're in your corner. Call Savan and his team, 1-855-821-5900 or go to disabilityrights.ca. You lost your job. They said they had a good reason, but you think you've been wrongfully dismissed. Now what are you going to do? I'm going to employmentlawyer.ca. Always check with the employment lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. All right, welcome back. Disability Law Show. John Scholes and Savannah Tamarkin, of course, reaching out. 1-855-821-5900. You can also go to disabilityrights.ca. Whilst there, you can find links to our long-running radio show as well. Savannah, I want to get into this. So three mistakes that your disability lawyer could possibly make while handling your LTD claim. First one is this, pal. Not explaining the legal process to you in detail. Ignorance in this case is not bliss. You want to know what's going on. Yeah, you know, John, let me just start by saying that these mistakes, I mean, we're only listing three here, but mm -hmm. there are many, many mistakes. And I've seen lawyers over the years make these mistakes, sometimes because they're careless, sometimes because they just don't care. And, and you know, neither is acceptable, certainly not at our firm. Uh, and uh, when I used to work for insurance companies on the other side years and years ago in defending insurance companies, I can tell you that these mistakes often would result in significant losses of, of money and compensation to individuals who are injured and who are disabled. So you want me to make sure that whichever lawyer or law firm you have, uh, that you've hired or gonna hire, that they're gonna be good lawyers, they know what they're doing, and they're not gonna make these mistakes. So let's start with the first one, what you just said, which is when you hire a lawyer, you expect that lawyer, and rightfully so, to explain the entire process to you you need to understand what your claim is about. And I give the analogy often that if I'm going to undergo major surgery, like heart surgery, I want the doctor that's gonna operate on me to explain to me exactly what's gonna happen. Now, I don't need to understand, I don't need to know, you know, the, the, the minutia of it, right? I'm not gonna understand it. In fact, when my wife, who's an accountant, uh, or my brother, who's a doctor, speak to me about accounting or medicine, in detail, using medical speak or accounting speak, I, I, you know, I lose track, I get bored, I have no clue what they're saying. By the same token, you need to make sure that whichever lawyer you hire speaks in layman's terms. The law is not complicated, generally speaking. There's no reason why lawyers make it complicated, and there is even less of a reason why they don't explain to you uh, in a way that you can really understand every step of the process. Look, it's your case. And if the lawyer doesn't take the time to explain exactly what to expect in terms of what are the next steps in the proceeding, when, can, when will these steps happen or, or anticipated to happen, you know, what could happen along the way that you know, may sidetrack the case, unless your lawyer goes through these in detail, okay? And I'm not talking about sitting down for five hours. I'm talking about taking a good hour and actually answering all your questions. I often use charts and just draw things just for simplicity's sake, because it helps me even understand what I'm explaining to, to my client. Uh, but I've done this so many times now that for me, it's a piece of cake. And I want to make sure that my client understands completely what not only to expect, but you know, they understand what not to expect. So I can tell them that if something happens, that should not be happening. Meaning, for example, example, uh, you're, and once we get involved, the adjuster, your adjuster should not be communicating with you. They can only communicate with us as your lawyers. You know, and some lawyers don't explain that to their clients. And what happens is that the individual continues communicating with the adjuster to their own detriment. So explaining the process, explaining what to expect, explaining what should not happen, this is a conversation that has to be had between the lawyer and the individual at the beginning and then along the way whenever the individual has questions. So critical, critical thing. Many lawyers make that mistake. They think that the clients are not important enough to actually explain everything to them. And to me, that is a huge red flag. And it tells me that the lawyer not only has a super ego, but is not a good lawyer. Because a good lawyer would not do that. A good lawyer would sit down and explain everything uh, to, to the individual, whether it's in person or because of COVID now, by phone, by Zoom, any other platform, but just explain it. Another uh, mistake your lawyer can make, you gotta watch out for this one, is not collecting enough and the necessary medical reports to make your case as strong and robust as possible, right? Yeah, I mean, remember, we talk about this all the time on the show, about how important your doctors are, the people who are treating you. 
And whether that's a psychologist or a surgeon, chronic pain doctor, chiropractor, you need those people on your side. And if they confirm in writing that you are disabled, that you cannot do your own occupation or any occupation, depending on where you are in the long-term disability process, if they don't give that, then we don't have ammunition against the insurance company. The insurance company then is going to say there's insufficient medical documentation. So, you know, a good lawyer is not just going to go on cruise control. A good lawyer is not going to just going to say, uh, you know, okay, John, just give me whatever you have and we'll go from there. No. I speak with my clients and explain, here's what I need from your doctors. I don't tell the doctors what to write. I'm not a doctor but I tell the individual and their doctor what I need. And I need to understand how far will the doctor go in saying this or that. Again, I'm not putting words in the doctor's mouth, but I need some time to just suss it out. I need to get the information from the doctor that is helpful for my client. And by the way, that's with treating doctors. Sometimes we need to get experts to bolster right, our, our, our client's case and to make sure that we really make the point to the insurance company that not only do we have treating doctors on side, but we have experts who are going to back up the treating doctors. Again, it's a proactive approach, okay, to the collection and utilization of medical documents in a disability case. You do not want a lawyer who is going to run your case on cruise control. Because that's just like, you know, the example I often give is, is imagine if, 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 you know, you're in a race, a car race, do you really think that the person who puts cruise control on their vehicle is going to win that race? No. Uh, we are competing here. We are racing against the insurance company. And I want to make sure my client comes in first. And, and one of the ways to do that is to be proactive and make sure that we get the best medical information that we can from the treating doctors and any experts to put in front of the insurance company. All right, third mistake, we said the best one for last and probably the most obvious one is this. Your insurance lawyer, disability lawyer, settles your case for much less than they should. John, it happens. It happens, and, and it ha I mean, since we launched the show a long time ago, and the radio show even before that, I can tell you I have heard from so many people who have contacted me for the purpose of, first of all, evaluating their claim, and then when I find out, when I speak with them, that they've already settled, and I tell them that they've settled for a tenth of what they're owed, or a fifth, or a fourth, or half, you know what they ask me? They say, can I undo it? Can I claim duress? Can I say that, you know, I, I did not understand? No, you can't. Once you settle, you settle. There are very, very few exceptions to undoing a settlement, and for good reasons, right? I mean, we need finality to these kinds of cases. When I was working for insurance companies many, many years ago, I would, again, protect my clients, which were insurance companies, and I would come across lawyers who were phenomenal. And I knew that my insurance clients would have to pay a lot of money to settle those claims. But I also came across, more often than not, mediocre lawyers and lawyers who don't care, lawyers who are just trying to make a buck. And, you know, those lawyers would settle their clients' cases, unbeknownst to their clients, for a fraction of the money that their clients deserved. And I knew that, but again, my clients were insurance companies. So now when, you know, we work now for individuals, only for individuals, I take every case very seriously. I, you know, I do not want to feel, and I certainly don't want my client to feel, like we left one dollar that's owed to them on the table. Because that dollar, if we leave that on the table, that gets collected by the insurance company and goes into their pockets. And that's not right. It has to go into my client's pockets, into, into my client's family's pockets. Oftentimes, individuals who are fighting for disability you know, are at risk for losing their home. They're at risk for not being able to pay the bills. You know, it, it, it's extremely important extremely important that when you go to a lawyer or a law firm that deals with long-term disability, that you go to people who care about the money that is owed to you. Because if you go to somebody who all they care about is just, you know, volume and, and you know, treating your case like, like, a, like a, you know, a factory uh, uh, thing, you're going to end up with a lot less money, a lot less money than what you deserve, and you do not want to be in that position. Coming up here, what to do if your employer says they cannot accommodate you due to COVID-19. That is on the way, Savannah, but we'll take a short break. In the meantime, help at disabilityrights.ca. That's the email address. And phone number 1-855-821-5900. Stick around. We're coming right back. You were being harassed, and when you said something about it, you're the one who lost your job. Now what are you going to do? I'm going to employmentlawyer.ca. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. Insurance companies deny long-term disability claims all the time. They give lots of excuses. Don't give up. I've seen it all. They've ignored your doctors. They've ignored you. You're angry and you're frustrated. But there's hope. We resolve disability claims all the time. We force insurers to pay what they owe. We're in your corner. 
Call Savannah and his team, 1-855-821-5900 or go to disabilityrights.ca. You thought you had a secure job. You didn't see it coming. Now what do you do? I'm going to employmentlawyer.ca. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. Hey, welcome back. Thanks for sticking around. Disability Law Show. It's time, uh, Savannah, to get a couple emails on the air. Again, help at disabilityrights.ca. That's any time, even when we're not on the air here. You can go there and drop Savannah and his team an email. And they'll reply, uh, reply very quickly. This one today, uh, first one anyway, comes from Sandra Savannah. She says, my sister's in her 50s and has rheumatoid arthritis and had to stop working as an assembler. She got disability benefits for a while, but now her insurance company is cutting her off, saying she could uh, work as a telemarketer. Her hands are deformed and she has no computer skills. Her employer previously said they could try to accommodate her in a different type of job, but because of COVID, they now say there is no work for her. What can she do? Well, again, I mean, thank God for people like Sandra who look out for, for their family. You know, John, uh, we get contacted left, right, and center by concerned family members, friends, colleagues. Again, if you are watching this show, like Sandra, you know someone who may need this help, please, please get in touch with us or have them get in touch with us so we can help. Now, John, to answer Sandra's question, look, ultimately what's happening here is that the insurance company is trying to figure out a way not to pay Sandra's sister. And what they're saying is that uh, she should be able to do a different kind of job. And obviously it's clear from this email, and I'm sure the medical documents are going to further support this, that she cannot do that job that they want her to do. She simply cannot uh, with her condition. But the insurance company knows that at the two-year mark, most LTD policies you know, have that change of definition for total disability where you have to show that it's no longer about whether you can do your own occupation, it's can you do any occupation for which you're suited for. And that's the key here, any occupation for which you are suited for. You know, and if Sandra's sister is not suited for that new job as a telemarketer, well then it's that simple. She cannot do it, they have to pay her. You know, there is an employment component here too as to whether or not the employer has an obligation to accommodate and now we have COVID thrown in. You know, at the end of the day, to me, that's a red herring. She may have an employment case here because, you know, employers do have a duty to accommodate, so we can advise her on this. But at the end of the day, again, the insurance company should not be stopping her benefits. If she's unable to work, not only in her own occupation, but any occupation for which she's suited for, by training, education, or experience, her LTD ought to continue. And the fact that they are not continuing her payments means that she has a case. And we can help her with that case. We can start a claim against the insurance company. And I'm telling you, John, with her condition and her situation and COVID now, we can get this resolved fairly quickly. And you know, when I say fairly quickly, by the way, we've had situations in the last few months where our lawyers, in fact, I know of one in particular just this past week, where one of our lawyers simply we just got retained because the individual was cut off long-term disability and the lawyer at my office simply wrote a letter to the insurance company asking for their file. She didn't ask demanding that the decision be reversed, just asking for a copy of the adjuster's file. And the adjuster wrote back essentially saying, oops, we made a mistake, we should not have cut off uh, your client. Right. You know, what does that tell you? I mean, it either tells me that they're negligent on the, oh, you know, over there with the insurance company, that they don't know what they're doing, or that they were betting that this person, our client, would walk away from money that's owed to her. And the fact, the simple fact that she engaged legal counsel, a lawyer at my firm, and we have a reputation in this field, was enough, obviously, to, I guess, scare the adjuster into putting this individual back on claim. Now, not every case is going to be like this, right? I mean, every case is different. But it's important to understand that oftentimes insurance companies are either negligent in the, the way they handle these claims or that they are simply, you know, betting the odds here. They, they, are, they are playing the odds that you're going to walk away. You're not going to challenge them. Or if you do, you're going to do it through that internal uh, process that we don't like to talk about called an appeal. Uh, and, and these appeals, again, are useless because you're appealing these denials to the exact same people, exact same company that denied you in the first place. 
You know, you've already determined that she can't work, period. That's the whole the whole crux of this email. But there's also the fact, now, she didn't mention what her salary was as an assembler. I'm, I'm assuming, based on that job, it's pretty good. But even if they wanted her to become a telemarketer, I mean, the, the, the delta, I would assume, in pay, doesn't that bring about the, the concept or legal, legal term of commensurate income? I mean, that wouldn't be 60, 65 percent of being a telemarketer from an assembler. Yeah, I yeah. See that being realistic. 100%, 100%. In fact, I, I was communicating with earlier today with a gentleman um, just outside of Vancouver who um, uh, is in that situation. And, and in fact, here's the interesting thing. Uh, the insurance company, uh, the adjuster, said to him, uh, you're going to do whatever job we're going to tell you to do at the, at the two-year mark. No questions asked. And, and so he's, he, he emailed us, basically, uh, emailed me to find out whether or not that's in fact the case. And I said, no, absolutely not. You know, when, when, when the provisions in the LTD policy say that, uh, you know, the test, the, the, the test for, for getting LTD changes to any occupation uh, for which you're suited for, that does not mean that if you're a doctor, for example, you now have to go work at Tim Hortons. Nothing wrong with working at Tim Hortons, but, but commensurate income is the concept which sort of flows together with uh, the change of definition to any occupation. Basically, it means this. If at the two-year mark you can do another job, another occupation that pays you 60, 65 percent or higher of your pre-disability income, well then at that point there's a good argument from the insurance side that you're not eligible for more LTD. But you, the insurance company can't tell you to suddenly go do a, a job, an occupation that pays you 20 percent, 30 percent, 40 percent, 50 percent of what you earn pre-disability. So, so, you know, that's usually what I tell people. If at the two-year mark, you can do a job, an occupation that pays you about 65% or so of your pre-disability income, you're probably not disabled under the provisions of the policy. But again, it's a case-by-case -case basis, John. And, and, and you know, it, it, sometimes people can make that money, but still, uh, they may meet the definition for total disability. So check with us. We'll get to Manuel quickly here. We've only got a couple minutes left, but uh, we'll do it. I know we can. Manuel says I'm 40 years old and have stopped working as an assistant manager at a store due to depression and a toxic workplace. I'm still not better, and my psychiatrist says I can't work. I received LTD benefits for a year before being cut off. My doctor did mention to the insurance company that I played in a tournament last summer. Is that enough to lose my insurance benefits? Hmm. It's, it's a good question. Uh, again, we're seeing a situation here where a person suffers from a mental illness. Um, you know, the question is, if you suffer from mental illness, does that mean you can't participate in other parts of your life? Look, from an optic standpoint, I can see many people out there thinking to themselves, well, wait a second, if you can participate in some kind of a tournament, uh, you should be able to work. Yes and no, it depends on the situation. It depends what kind of a tournament, it depends, did you have a good day, did you have, you know, is this something that is helpful for your recovery? Um, you know, certainly if you're saying that you have a bad back and you can't work because of a bad back and then, uh, you know, I see you playing soccer with your friends, that's a problem. But if a person has depression and then that person plays in some kind of a tournament, maybe the tournament was just with former colleagues or friends, you know, there's an argument here that that was something that is helpful to that person's healing, to put them back on the right track. Maybe that person is going to be able to go back to work soon. Who knows? But the reality is this. If ultimately you have medical support, you have doctors saying you cannot work, the insurance company should be paying you long-term disability. In a case like this where they do see you doing something outside of, of home, outside of work, like playing in a tournament, that could be problematic. You know, I mean, we have, to be, we have to be clear here. You know, if this ever goes before a judge, I can see a judge saying, you know what, this is something that shows that you are not as totally disabled as you said you were. So, John, it's a case-by-case -case basis. But, again, you have to do things that are reasonable. And, again, the message is if you can work, work. You should work. Yeah. Disability is not there for people who just don't want to work. It's there for people who cannot work because of a medical condition. Good show again, my friend. And we'll wrap it up for now. You want to send along an email like we read a couple of them today? No problem. That is simply help at disabilityrights.ca. Shorten that to just disabilityrights.ca, the website there. You will catch links to our long-running radio show. Feel free to call into that whenever we're on and email as well. And the website at any time, disabilityrights.ca, has so much involved with it as well. Finally, the phone number, 1-855-821-5900 is how you reach out. We'll catch you next time. Disability Law Show. Thanks for hanging around.